Hello and welcome to this session. This is Professor Farhat. In this session, we're going to be looking at debt restructuring. This topic is covered in advanced accounting and it's also covered on the CPA, specifically the FAR section. As always, I would like to remind you to connect with me on LinkedIn if you are if we are not connected already and make sure to subscribe to my YouTube. I have over 1,500 plus accounting, auditing and tax lectures. Please like my lectures if you like them, share them, put them in the playlist, let the world know about them. If you're benefiting from my YouTube, it means other people might benefit as well. This is my Instagram account, this is my Facebook account, and this is my website. On my website, I often have CPA offer. Right now, I have a limited time offer for the gold standard CPA preparation with Becker. Right now, Becker is offering a thousand dollar off of the, of the best course out there with unlimited access. Now, you have to keep in mind, when you want to buy something, make sure you buy something when it's on sale. Now, why do companies put things on sale when it's a slow season? So right now it's summertime. It's a slow season. If you need a CPA course, buy it now and get a thousand dollar off. You will not get this offer when the busy season is on, which is toward the end of the year or, or post the tax season. So take advantage of this offer, whether you're studying for your exam or if you are still a college student, Becker can supplement your education, your accounting education. So today we're going to be talking about troubled debt restructuring. The first thing I want to tell you is this. This topic is close to my heart. And the reason is this. Because I was practicing during 2007, 2008, 2009, and to a degree 2010. Because this was still going on, the financial crisis. And if you know anything about those years, those were the financial crisis, the great financial crisis. And what happened during this time, many companies, especially companies that deals with construction, real estate, went through that debt restructuring. They got into trouble. They, they borrowed money prior to the financial crisis. They borrowed the money in 2005, 2006, when the economy is doing well. When 2007, 2008 hits, they were having difficulty paying back their loans. So what happened is they work with the, the bank and their lenders work with them a uh, some sort of a structuring of the debt. So this is why this topic is close to my heart. So what is treble debt restructuring? It occurs when a creditor, think of it as a bank, it doesn't have to be a bank, for economic or legal reason related to the debtor's financial difficulty, grant a concession. Because think of it, economic difficulties, we're not going to go into the legal reasons, because of economic difficulties, the debtor cannot pay their loan, they're having through, through uh, they're going through a financial difficulty, and clearly in 2007, 2008, both the debtor and the creditor were going through financial difficulties. So they grant some sort of a concession, then it would not, buy it it otherwise would not be considered. What what do we mean by otherwise it, it would not be considered? Here they are not refinancing because companies sometimes they refinance their loan. Well, the, if the interest rate goes down, they refinance their loan. Here we are not talking about refinancing the loan. Here we're talking about there are some difficulties. The uh, the the debtor, the person, that, the company that borrowed the money is going through some difficulty and can, they cannot pay off their loan. Refinancing occur when the company decides to refinance because of lower interest rate. That's not the case here. So what happened? Here what here's what happened. Maybe the loan was originated, let's assume, in 2005. Okay? In 2007 or the end of 2007, they find out that you know the, the debtor is not really paying their loan. So they did what they did is they did the loan impairment. So they, they reduced the balance of the loan on their books. Then in 2008, what happened is the the the, uh, the financial crisis still going on so the bank says let's work some sort of a deal let's work some sort of a deal and hopefully it will stop here what do you mean work some sort of a deal let's do some debt restructuring let's restructure the debt and hopefully if we restructure the debt you will be able to pay us something rather than us not getting anything well if this doesn't work we would go into a bankruptcy eventually will force you into bankruptcy so this is what we're going to be talking about today basically some sort of a debt restructuring modification of the terms so it involved two basic transactions when we, when we modify the term maybe we're going to settle the debt less than the carrying value what does that mean you owe us a million we will accept seven hundred thousand give us the money and we'll call it even or we're going to keep the debt going but we're going to change the terms we may give you longer period to pay or we may lower your interest rate not because you're refinancing because you're going through through some financial difficulties now bear in mind what we're talking about here today not bankruptcy okay we are talking about a specific debt we're looking at specific debt we are not restating all the liabilities we're looking at a specific debt with a specific loan okay 
So what would the settlement involve? So when we go through the settlement, it, it, involved, it could involve the debtor may transfer assets in full settlement. So this could be a reason. We just get it done like this. The debtor may give an equity interest in a firm for full settlement. Guess what? We borrowed money from you. How about this? Why don't we switch the loan into equity? Simply put, we don't have money to pay you, but we'll give you stocks. Would you accept? If that's the case, you switch the debt into equity and you settle the loan. Or the creditor may modify the term of the payable. Modify means they may extend the, uh, they may lower the payment, extend the payment, lower the interest rate, or a combination of all of those. Okay. Now, anything that, that the creditor receive, anything that the creditor receive from the debtor, it's valued at fair market value. So if we gave the creditor a piece of land, some sort of an equity investment, it's always valued at fair value. Now, the next thing we're going to do, we're going to look at all three transfer of assets, the debtor giving some equity or modification of the loan and work an example. Explain them a little bit further and work an example, starting with the transfer of asset, which is one of three, one of three options. The debtor may, that transfer asset to a creditor in full settlement of a payable recognizes, recognizes a gain. So if the debtor transfers some sort of an asset, let's assume the asset is worth 100000 and you owe a loan for 130, then you have a gain of 30000 the gain is measured by the axis of the carrying value of the payable over the fair value of the asset. So I'm giving you something that's worth, worth only 100000 and you are forgiving my $130,000 loan. The difference between the fair value and the carrying value of the asset transferred is a gain or a loss and is reported as a component of net income for the period transfer. Now let's take a look at this example to illustrate this concept. The debtor transfer a land with a cost of 20000 fair value of 50. So right there, stop right there. If we transfer a land that's worth 20,000 with a fair value of 15, immediately what we have to do is to book a loss. And the loss is 5,000. What is the loss? The loss is on the land. Think about if you want to sell this land. If you sell this land, you only get 15,000 for it. Therefore, you have a loss of the land. Now you transfer this land that's worth 15,000. That's the fair value of the land. And you remove a payable that's worth 25. So you transfer the land and they say, guess what? Your payables are forgiving. Guess what? For this deal, you have a gain of 10,000. So notice you have a loss. You have to book a loss because the land is worth 15,000. If you sold it, it's worth 15, but it's on the books, it's worth 20. That's a loss on the land, but on the debt restructuring, you have a gain. So the debt restructuring is you have a gain. Let's take a look at another example. Let's assume bar company who's, finan who's, who's in financial difficulty and in the process of voluntary reorganization has agreed to transfer to a creditor a copyright it owns for a full settlement of a $100,000 payable and $15,000 in accrued interest. Simple English, we owe the creditor $150,000 loan and we are behind on our interest for $15,000. So simply put, we owe in total $165,000. $150,000 is the note and $15,000 is the interest. The copyright, which originally cost 100000 this is the cost, has an accumulated amortization of 55. Well, now we can find the book value of it. So we have 100000 minus 55. The book value of this copyright is 45000 This is the book value. And a current value of 95. So the fair market value, so the book value is 45. The fair value is 95. Well, the first thing we have to do the first thing we have to do is we have to determine if we have a gain on the on the copyright itself. If we sell this copyright today, we can sell it for 95 and the book value is 45. Therefore, we have a gain of 50,000. We have a gain of 50,000 on the copyright itself. This is a gain of 50,000. Okay, this is a gain. Then we have to book the gain. Simply put, what we have to do is we have to increase the asset by 50,000 and book the gain of 50,000. And this is what it looked like. We have to increase the asset by 50,000 and credit the gain of 50,000. Now the copyright, remember, now the copyright has a value. Now the copyright book, now the copyright on the books, It this is the copyright. It, it was at 100,000. Now we wrote it up by 50. Now the book value or the yeah, the book value, not the book value, the cost is 150 or the asset is listed at 150. Okay. So that's that. Now, so we have a gain on the revaluation of the asset. 
Now we have to do what? We have to do the following. First, we have to remove the loan because remember, we owe the loan of 150. So we have to remove the loan. So we have to debit notes payable 150 because we have to remove the loan. We have to remove the accrued interest. Accrued interest is 15,000. Those are liabilities, therefore we debit them. Those are the debit. What else do we have to do? Remember, we remove the asset. The asset has 150 debit and uh, 55 of accumulated depreciation. So we have to debit accumulated depreciation to remove the depreciation, and we have to credit the asset. We have to credit the asset. Then we have to determine if we had a gain or a loss on this deal. Well, let's think about it. We owe, we owe them, we owe, um, we owe the company, we owe the company 165,000. That's how much we owe the company. Now, from for this 165,000, we gave them an asset that is worth, what's the worth of the asset? Let's find out. 150, what's the book value of the asset? Minus 55. 150 minus 55, the book value of the asset is 95,000. The book value of the asset, by the time we get to the debt restructuring, is 95,000. 95,000. 95,000 book value, and they are removing a loan that's worth 65. We're giving them something that's worth 95. They're said, well, your loan is forgiving. I'm going to forgive this loan. Notice I debited this loan for the, the, both loans for 165. They're gone. Well, guess what? You have a gain. And what's the gain? The gain is 70,000 on the debt restructuring. Notice we have a gain on the debt restructuring and a gain on the transfer of the asset. So the asset, we have to revalue the asset first. And when, re, when we revalue the asset, we book the gain. Then when we went through the debt restructuring, we had another gain. So we had two gains. We had a, two gains of a total of 120. Okay. Now, the question is, how do we report those gains? Well, how do we report those gains? Well, the gain on the transfer of the 50,000 should be reported as a separate item, assuming it's, it's a material amount. If it's not a material amount, it will be reported with other gains. The gain on the 70,000 should be reported as a separate amount, because now we want to show that this is a debt restructuring. A gain from debt restructuring is not really good in a sense that, you know, you should not be proud of it. Therefore, you need to disclose it separately if there's a gain on restructuring. So let's change the scenario a little bit and let's assume the fair value of the asset rather than, uh, how much was it earlier? Rather than uh, 95, rather than 95, let's assume the fair value of the asset was 30. What happened if the value of the asset is 30? Well, the first thing we have to do is we, let's assume we sold this asset. That's because we need to revalue the asset. Well, the fair value equal to 30. What's the book value? The book value of the asset was 100,000 cost minus 55 accumulated depreciation. The book value was 45. This is the book value. Well, guess what? We have a loss. We debit a loss of 15 and we credit the, we credit the asset. We have to write down the asset. Now, the asset is only worth 15,000. So we have a loss. Why? Because the fair value is 30. The book value is 45. The next thing we're going to have to do, we're going to have to, we're, we gave them the, uh, now we're going to give them the uh, copyright and we're going to start to remove the debt. So the first thing we do is we debit the note, debit the accrued interest. This is the 165. They are forgiven 165. Now we have to debit accumulated amortization. Just remove the asset, remove the asset, copyright with the book value of 85, remove the asset as well. Okay. Remember it's 100,000 minus 15. Okay, which is 85 because we reduced the asset. Why did we reduce the asset? Because of the revaluation. Now, let's compute to see if we have a gain or we have a loss on this example. We gave them an asset that's only worth, that's only worth, okay? That's only worth how much, okay? Um, we gave them an asset, I'm sorry, not it's only worth, the, the book value. We gave them an asset with a book value of, let's see, 85,000 minus 55,000. So the book value of the asset is 30,000. The book value of the asset is 30,000. We gave them something that's worth 30,000. And they said, guess what? We're going to forgive 165 of your debt restructuring. Guess what? That's a good deal. We have a gain. How much is the gain? The gain is 135,000. 135,000. Not bad at all. Not bad at all.
So notice we work an example where we had the, the fair value of the asset was less than the book value and one example where the fair value is higher. The second option is to grant an equity interest. And what do you mean by grant equity interest? I'm not sure if you guys remember this company called Borders. Borders is used to be like uh, Barnes and Noble. It's basically a bookstore. Maybe you remember it, maybe not. Borders. Okay, used to go there a lot. Borders also went through trouble. They faced financial difficulties and they could not pay their liabilities. So here's what Borders did. They offered their supplier, which is the book publisher, equity. They said, guess what? We have an account payable. Let's assume, you know, $20 million for our suppliers. Would you be interested in switching that? and will give you equity worth of 20 million. And the publisher said, no, we're not interested. So that, that, that was their last resort. Why? Because the publisher knew Borders was not doing well. How did they know this? Because Borders were not paying their well. Okay? So this is what you do. You, you offer them equity. Said, I will give you stocks in my company. You just remove my debt. That's the idea. Okay? So the debtor may issue equity interest in the firm uh, to a creditor in full settlement of a payable. Okay? So the creditor will account for the note at its uh, the, would account for the stock at its fair value if they received equity stocks. So the difference between the fair value of the equity issued and the carrying amount of the debt is reported as a gain. So if you gave them, uh, let's assume you owe them a million dollar, you gave them only eight hundred thousand of equity, you have a gain. The debtor determined the gain based on the undiscounted cash flow. So if, the, if there is no fair market value for the stock, you figure out what's the discounted cash flow. The best way to illustrate this is to work a quick example. So let's assume American Citibank agrees to accept from Union Mortgage $320,000 $320, shares of its common $10 par value. The fair value is $16 million. So the mortgage company told the bank, I will give you 320,000 shares of stocks that are worth today 16 million, but you have to remove my loan that I owe you, which is 20 million. Do I have a gain? Of course I have a gain. Why? Because I am removing a debt of 20 million with only 16 million of value. So what do I do? I debit the bank. This is, um, uh, th this is the bank. So let's look at the bank's perspective. The bank will debit equity investment of 16 million. Now they have an investment, which is an asset. This is the bank entry. This is American Citibank. They will they have a loss allowance for doubtful account because now they have basically a loss on the receivable and they credit a note. They will credit the note to remove the note because the mortgage company owe, owe them 20 million. Now they, they no longer owe them 20 million. What they did, they removed the note and they replace it with 16 million. And in between they have a loss. Now let's take a look at the mortgage company. What would the mortgage company do? The mortgage company, they have to remove the note. The mortgage company is very happy because they removed the note. They credit common stock by 3.2 million. Now why 3.2 million? Maybe you know this, maybe not. It's the number of shares times the par value. Par value is $10. That's giving in the problem. 3.2 million. Um, then they will, the remainder of the 16 million is paid in capital. Remember, those two has to equal to 16 million. Whatever we give to common stock, anything that's left goes into paid in capital. Now, obviously, since the bank has a loss of 4 million, we have a gain of 4 million, the union mortgage company. Why do we have a gain of 4 million? Because we settled a loan. We owe them, initially we owe them 16 million, but we only, I'm sorry, we owe them 20 million and we pay them 16. So for us, it's a gain. Obviously, the other side of the party, there is basically a loss of $4 million. They had to write down their asset. They had to write down their asset. A third option for, um, uh, for a debt resettlement is modification of terms. What is modification of terms? Here, what we're doing is we are changing the terms. Basically, we might extend the terms, we might change the interest rate, some sort of a modification. The debtor in, in, in trouble debt restructuring involving only modification of terms of a payable account for the effect of the restructuring prospectively from the time of the restructuring. Simply put, we don't look back. We just say we, we modify the loan, then we look forward to in computing the interest, the principal, basically be according to the new terms of the loan. So the carrying value of the payable is not changed at the time of the restructuring unless the carrying value exceeds the total future cash flow. So the carrying value of the payable is not changed unless the carrying value is greater the carrying value is greater than the future cash flow. What does that mean? Think about it for a moment. Think about it for a moment. The carrying value, the book value of the loan 
should be less than the future cash flow. Why? Because the loan, because in the in the future, when you pay the future cash flow, the future cash flow has to be more. Why? Because it involves interest. So we don't do any modification unless the carrying value is greater than the cash flow. Because the loan, remember, the loan, any loan is the present value of payments. Therefore, the loan, the present value of the loan, so the book value of the loan should be lower than the payments. If we happen to have a deal where the book value of the loan exceeds the future value of the payment, that's a little bit unusual, then what we have to do, and I talk, about, I talk about this topic more in my intermediate accounting chapter 14, then we no longer charge interest, the loan, be, the payments will be all, will be all principal. Okay, we have to change the, uh, the loan to the to equal to the future cash flow payment. Okay, but just FYI, because one more time, any loan, loan equal to the present value of payments. So the loan is recorded at the present value of the payments. Well, if you compute all the future cash flow, those should be higher. If they happen to be lower after the modification, then you have to adjust. Okay, just have to know this. Let's take a look at this example to see how this all works. Lake Company, a major creditor to the financially troubled Spain company, had agreed to modify the terms uh, of a debt owed to Lake Company. The, the debt consists of 9 million, 12% note that's due currently, along with accrued interest of 95,000. So the loan, the, uh, the principal of the loan is 900,000, and there is 95,000 in, in interest that's unpaid. Lake Company agreed to extend the due date of the note and accrued interest for three years and to reduce the interest rate to 5%. They were charging them 12, now they're gonna charge them five, and they agreed to increase the payment into three years on both the maturity value and the accrued interest and the interest to be paid annually. So that's the deal, okay? So the first thing is we want to know, should a gain, should a gain be recognized by Spain company, okay? Now let's think about it for a moment. Should a gain be recognized? Well, how much do we owe them today? How much do we owe them today? Well, we owe them today. Today we owe them 995,000. Now what you have to do you have to compare this to the new, to the new, uh, to the new, the, to the new future cash payment. Okay. Now the interest rate is five percent on the new loan, and they extended the the term by three years. So let's take a look at this. No gain should be recognized because the total future cash payment specified under the new terms one million one hundred forty four thousand two fifty, which is nine hundred ninety five thousand. This is what we owe them now. What else do we have to do? We have to also pay uh, plus three years interest of 49,750 uh, 49, plus those, plus, plus the interest payment will give us 1,144,250. We have to pay this much and we owe them this much. So do we have a gain? No, we don't have a gain because the payments that we're gonna be making will be greater, will be greater than what we owe them today. So let's book the journal entry today for this deal. Well, if we book the journal entry, we have to remove the note. We debit the note because they said, you know, your note is forgiven. We debit the accrued interest because also the accrued interest is forgiven. We have basically a new loan. And the new loan is 995,000. And on this loan, we're gonna be making three payments, basically. Th extended for three years, making three payments, which include interest. So basically, this is a modification of the terms. Now. In advanced accounting, I don't go into modification of the terms much, much, much more in details because this topic is mostly covered in advanced accounting. So if you want to know more about modification of the terms, including gains, losses, different scenarios, go to my website where under, under intermediate accounting chapter 14, and I have plenty of, I have one whole lecture about modification of terms because it gets really, really involved. If you happen to visit my website, please consider donating if you are studying for your CPA exam. As always, study hard, it's worth it, and see you on the other side of success.